Hi, I'm Lou with another episode of My Car Story. And today we're out at St. Charles, Illinois at the Indian Uprising Pontiac Show. And with that, I met John. John, what's your last name? John Armstrong. John Armstrong. John, let me grab this. John, you put together a project that uh, is almost kind of unbelievable because this car looks exactly <laughs> like the one. What, what year was the car that this represents? The 1930 Indianapolis race car owned and built by Ira Vail who was a famous race car driver uh, back in the 20s. Uh, it's reported that there were times when he was pulling down five grand a week. And this car is in Oakland. This car is in Oakland, yes. And Oakland was what to Pontiac? Oakland was a parent company of Pontiac. Oakland was formed in 1908, uh, became a General Motors product by with Billy Durant's purchase in 1909. And in 19... 26, Oakland introduced a running make car, which was common for most of the manufacturers. Uh, Buick had Marquette, Cadillac had LaSalle, etc. And Oakland introduced Pontiac. Let me take a look at this over here. Come right alongside me. So, this is what we're going to see the Tribute Racer. Now, what came upon you that said, I love this car and let me build? An exact replica. I'm going to show the car while you talk. Come right alongside me. <laughs> Look at this. Come right alongside me. Okay. There's the microphone. I want to show the car. You keep talking about it. Okay. This uh, is it. I mean, this is the, uh, you know, obviously the real car, come on with me, was was wrecked, but this car looks identical. Go ahead. Tell me about yes, this. Yes. Uh, the uh, original car was uh, scrapped after the race, and the engine appeared in a single-seat racer in 1931 and was on the dirt track circuit. Uh, the car came about, uh, Ira Vail uh, had uh, a friend that uh, told him how wonderful the Oakland V8 was. Uh, we estimate that information was about 19, or 30, February of 1930. Uh, he test drove in Oakland, was very impressed, uh, and decided he'd build a race car. He did not have Oakland as a sponsor until after the race when he touted the performance of the car. Why well, only one side the letters? Or letters the are on one side uh, so, because me. that's where the official was on one side of the car. Num it's necessary to have it on the other side. Any significance to number 38 in this car? No significance whatsoever. It's just the number he chose um, and put it on the car. How did you manufacture stuff like this? Uh, the the original, what we did was buy a 1930 Oakland chassis, just like I Reveal did, as documented in a letter that he wrote to the Oakland Motor Car Company, touting the performance of the car. He said he bought an Oakland chassis. Through photographs, we were able to blow up and make uh, documentation in terms of referencing sizes and dimensions. And we built the chassis much like he did. He shortened the chassis 14 inches. He narrowed the back three inches on each side to accommodate the springs on the outside. He bent back the section that has the gas tank and lowered it. And again, all of that was documented with photographs. We did not have uh, special programs such as CAD or uh, three-dimensional uh, CAD programs that, that they have right now. Let me keep looking at it while you're talking. Okay, so, so now what? So now we took those photographs and over a period of years discovered a total of uh, four photographs. And of those four photographs, we were able to enlarge and get uh, a really good picture of what the car was. For example, on yeah. this side... Go ahead, show me. On this side of the car, you notice that these two rivets are not the same height across. But on the other side of the car, they are squared perfectly, showing that they were putting the car together to race. They weren't putting it together to show. So is this uh, gas, gas line? The gas line is shaped and, and is the exact same type gas line used in a 1930 car. Let's open the engine compartment if we can. One thing that's really unusual, it took us several years to discover this, is that this car has a battery. And we couldn't discover what this was initially 
and we kept looking and thinking and thinking and we came to the conclusion that in the photograph there's two different colors of black, two shades of black and that meant that there was a saddle there of some kind and what looked like it might be a battery case. So we explored the fact that if you put in a battery there's no room. It had to be a really narrow battery as you can see by the starter. So uh, we started to investigate that and discovered in 1930 Buick introduced the first narrow battery. And it fits just perfect. <laughs> just the way it's supposed to. How did you get this? It is a, uh, a V8. No, that how, the, how did you get this? this is, it, is this period correct V8? Period, period correct V8. Those plates were reproduced in Australia from the originals. Oh. And it what makes this V8 unusual is that it's not set at 90 degrees to the pistons. So it's a 90 degree V8 and the valves run on roller cams horizontal to the engine. So mm -hmm. it, it's very unique in its d design. Let's fire this up, shall we? So we turn on the gas. There's your, your foot brace there. I enter from this side because being long-legged, they were much shorter, so they could have come in from ignition, safety cutoff. have something that the original did not have uh, that we haven't been able to document and that is the generator. The reason why we have a generator, I have been able to make this car roadworthy and actually take it out every week on the highway. So we have a generator to keep the battery charged up and uh, the other thing it has that the original did not have, the only other thing is a choke. And we decided that my wife since I want to drive it all the time, it's not going to stand there with her hand over the carburetor and at first backfire, she's in the house never to be seen again. Yeah, right. So we have a choke uh, established to take care of that. And you've taken this to Indianapolis. I saw the yes. badge here. And you've had this for a few laps on Indy. How many, la how many miles have you had it on Indy? Uh, let's see, we, uh, we had it probably seven, two and a half, four, about 20 miles each day that we were racing at Indy. We had a GPS with us on the last day and uh, we're able to clock it at 97 miles an hour. And the original one averaged about 95 and you said this was the first V8. The, the original introduced? average speed for qualifying was 95 miles an hour. The top speed was 105. Race day he averaged 85. And, and the V8 was, this is the first V8 introduced? This is the first V8 that we've been able to document at Indianapolis. Until this time, a V8 had not been run. Now, this is an undocumented fun story. Uh, so it's been said by a few that Henry Ford was so impressed with the performance of this V8 that he went back after the race, began the development of his famous 1932 flathead V8. Really? He raced a V8 in 31. Isn't that something? John, outstanding job. Unbelievable that you brought Thank this you. thing. I mean, it looks fantastically like well, the photos. Well, it, it took 10 people uh, in four countries to work on this. Uh, or excuse me, 48 people in four countries over 10 years. We have over 400 pages, excuse me, over 300 pages of documentation with me here today, and I have more documentation at home, probably over 400 pages, to verify everything that was done and how we did it. Now, you were, share with me, the reason why you wanted to build this car, you were president of the Oakland Club. I was president of uh, 
the uh, Oakland chapter of POCI, and uh, I am was president when I started this uh, of the Oakland Pontiac Worldwide AACA region. I am now, uh, you know, not president, but uh, I am uh, still actively involved in uh, promoting uh, the hobby and promoting uh, the AACA region, which specializes on only 1908 to 1958 cars, the first 50 years of Pontiac history. And I want to first of all on camera thank you because you immediately saw my son renew your car and you let him jump it and start your Indy car. Well, I go to a lot of charity functions and show the car. I do not go to local shows, only charity functions. And I'm a firm believer that if this hobby is going to exist, we need to involve the next generation. So this car is a hands-on car when it comes to young people. I put people in all the time. And it was my pleasure to let him get in there and fire it up. That and that smile he had when it was fired up was well worth it. <laughs> the smile I still have. John, what a treat. Thanks for being on My Car Story. A pleasure to meet you. Wonderful build. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you.